Today's stories are going to be about St. John Bosco's mother, whom everyone in the oratory called Mama Margarita. She was truly a legendary woman. The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Subscribe for new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Honor your father and mother, says the Lord. Don Bosco offered the young men a model in his observance of this commandment. He was always most tender in loving his parents. He spoke often and fondly of his father, whom he had not even known, and he prayed daily for the repose of his father's soul. For his mother, he showed all the respectful attention worthy of a son, and he consoled her with moving piety in her old age. He never put love for her ahead of love for God, but he assisted and helped her with everything she depended on him for. Don Bosco obeyed her, submitted meekly to her advice, and made no important decisions without mentioning them to her. He was happy to have her help and cooperation for the good of the pupils, and to have her act as a mother to all. Don Bosco spoke of her with veneration and showed her the liveliest gratitude for everything she endured while raising him. He especially commended her because she had taught him to love and serve God, instilling a great horror of sin in him. In later years, he remembered his mother with tenderness and childlike respect. He wanted the boys to obey and respect her. If anyone showed her less than reverence, Don Bosco would mention obedience in his evening sermon, reminding the boys, I'm the director of this house, and I obey my mother and try to respect her. I expect you to do likewise. He would remind them how she worked for them and listed the many ways she helped and served them. He reminded them of the mothers they had left behind at their homes and repeated the words of Tobias, Thou shalt honor thy mother all the days of her life, for thou must be mindful of the perils she suffered for thee in her womb. Don Bosco never missed an opportunity to honor his mother, Margarita. Her good humor and intelligence were present in even the most solemn moments. The feast day of her namesake fell in November, and the young people always celebrated it affectionately. On the evening before her name day, Don Bosco would have them bring her a big bouquet. The good mother greeted them smiling and listened quietly to the prose and poetry they recited for her. Once they finished, she would reply with a few words. Well, I thank you, though I do nothing for you. The one who really does everything is Don Bosco. However, I thank you for your good wishes and compliments. If Don Bosco permits tomorrow, I will give you all something extra for dinner. Then the cry of Viva Mama Margarita would resound and the gathering would break up. From Margarita's words, we can see how she had no purpose but to exalt her son in the presence of the youth and make sure they recognized him as the sole authority. Her humility made her dear to all. She was revered by all who knew her and even by those who only spent a short time with her in the oratory. From the beginning of her time in turn, she was called by no name other than mother. She treated all with the same gentleness and charity the duke, the marquis, the wealthy banker, the cobbler, and the chimney sweep. Whenever the many noble lords and ladies, bishops, and distinguished benefactors visited Don Bosco, they always appeared at Margarita's door to greet her as they arrived and left. Her outspoken virtue, simplicity of manner, and exquisite good sense were the objects of their liveliest interest. If they didn't find Don Bosco at home, then they waited by entertaining themselves with Mother Margarita. Those days there was no waiting area, and those gentlemen did not want to intrude or cause a disturbance. They were also reluctant to stand waiting on the balcony in the open air, sun, or rain. So they would knock at Margarita's door and ask, Mother, may we come in? The good woman was always sitting amid a few chairs among piles of the boys' poor and tattered clothes that needed to be patched. Come in, gentlemen, she replied. Clearing the chairs, she invited them to sit down. They were the wealthiest people in Turin, the wittiest, the most knowledgeable, the most reputable. Sometimes, with touching simplicity, she would say, If you allow me, then I'll finish my three Hail Marys. Then I'll be all yours. Go ahead, those gentlemen would reply, smiling. And Margarita would finish her prayer and say, Pax Christi. Then the conversation would begin. But if it sometimes languished, she would start praying other prayers in a whisper. 
Those gentlemen often spent a half hour and even whole hours with her, questioning and inviting her to talk. They delighted infinitely in her answers, thoughts, and the proverbs that always flourished on her lips. Sometimes, because of their familiarity, they would even ask her questions about morals, history, and politics. Margarita always retained a perfect and serene tranquility. She was never confused, impatient, ashamed, or awkward. Her answers didn't hint at foolishness, presumption, or silliness. Common sense and the catechism often came to her aid. If the visitors ever asked something beyond her understanding, she would reply with some quip or proverb about her ignorance, or tell them instead about something she had seen or heard, or something that had happened to her. These answers pleased her visitors immensely because they had deliberately steered the conversation toward complex topics to see how cleverly this simple woman, who had no formal education, would manage to extricate herself, and Margarita would laugh heartily along with them. Above all, she kept the promise she often made to the benefactors. I will pray for God to help them do their part and grant them all the prosperities they deserve. These notable connections changed nothing in her ideas and customs. Inspired by a love for the privations suffered by our Lord Jesus Christ, she repeated many times, I was born poor and I want to live and die poor. Notwithstanding the great poverty that reigned in the oratory, she used strict justice to give each person what was rightfully theirs. On every occasion, her heart showed itself full of delicate concern for all. One day, with a young boy named Giacomelli, she went to a store in front of the Corpus Christi Church to stock up on needles, thread, and buttons. After she paid for everything, they returned home with her purchases. As they walked, she mentally checked the math and realized that they had underpaid the shopkeeper three or four coins. From that moment, she could no longer be at peace. Going back into the house, she told Giacomelli, return at once to the store to see if they really made a mistake, but be careful to call aside the apprentice who sold us the goods and speak in such a way that the master will not see you. The boy did the errand exactly as she told him to. He reported Mother Margarita's words and placed those coins in the apprentice's hand. Surprised, the apprentice asked who had sent him back to the store. It's Don Bosco's mother, replied Giocomelli. Well, tell her I said thank you. Thank you so much, the apprentice said. If you had told the master, I would have been ruined. He would have sent me away for sure, and I would have been left without food to eat. So thank that good lady and tell her to come and do all her shopping in this store because I'll serve her better and give her a more competitive price than anyone else. All of these facts we have learned from Don Asanio Savio, Charles Tomatis, Joseph Buzzetti, and above all, Don Bosco himself. Thank you all so much for watching, and if you'd like to hear about how St. John Bosco escaped masons that were trying to assassinate him with long knives, just click on the video I've put on the screen. God bless you, and Our Lady keep you.